it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. and sisters it is the remnant warrior here from kingdom productions and publishing and i just want to welcome all of you who don't already watch this channel on a regular basis i want to let you know that we upload new content several times a week but at least every week so you don't want to miss out when we upload something new. Thank you all in advance for your subscription. I love each and every one of you. Until next time, God bless you all. Sanctified before there was sin in the world. Many of your critics argue that keeping it was only for Israel. They say it was the one ceremonial law in the Ten Commandments and that it passed away with the death of Christ. Even though no other ceremonial law carried the death penalty in Israel, they claim that Sabbath breaking was the lone exception. There are many bad arguments made against Seventh-day Adventism. They're so easily refuted, it's easy to assume your position must be the right one. When compared to the obvious errors of others, your position can appear very biblical. But there are also issues of which few Adventists are aware. Though there are churches that have compromised with the world, there are others that still faithfully follow God's word, ones who have heard your arguments and disagree with your conclusions. We have taken the time to hear you, and we ask that you take the time to hear us, as we challenge you to be good Bereans and to search the scriptures with us to know what is true. As your own teachers will tell you, many things changed with Jesus' death and resurrection. God promised Israel a new covenant, not like the one he made with their fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. At Sinai, he had given them a tabernacle. Only there could atonement be made for the people of Israel. Once a year, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and there sprinkle blood on the mercy seat that represented the throne of God. The tabernacle eventually gave way to the temple, about which Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. God destroyed the Jerusalem temple in 70 A.D. Its continuing sacrifices were a denial that a better priest had come, who offered a better once-for-all sacrifice in a far better temple. Through Jesus, we have boldness to personally enter before the throne of God. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, <laughs> 
and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The shadow of the old temple passed away, but the substance remained in a radically new form. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We still have a temple, and we still have sacrifices, but they are spiritual and in a very different form than before the coming of Christ. There were ceremonial laws given at Sinai that clearly passed away such as wearing clothes of mixed fibers. Israel had been made visibly different from the people around them, but those ordinances passed away when the gospel went out to the whole world. In Acts 15, a council took place in Jerusalem. The apostles considered what would be required of Gentiles who became Christians. They told the church, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Not only was the ceremonial law not binding on Christians, but neither was circumcision, something that had been given to Abraham hundreds of years before Moses. Circumcision was not part of the ceremonial law, but of the much older promise. It was given to Abraham as an everlasting covenant, yet even with it, the shadow gave way to a new substance. Paul says of Christ, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. The people of God are still circumcised, but in a very different manner than before. It's just a few verses later that Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Doug Batchelor comments on this. There were certain Sabbaths that came after sin. They were annual feasts that were shadows foretelling the coming of Christ. They were nailed to the cross, the handwriting of Moses, not the Sabbath that was part of creation. The Bible says in heaven we're going to keep that one. From one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship before the Lord. It's the annual Sabbath that Paul is talking about. There are several problems with that statement. The Greek word sabbaton is in the plural here, but it is used in the plural over 20 times in the New Testament to refer to the weekly Sabbath. Not once is it used, therefore, an annual Sabbath. Paul is echoing the Septuagint's translation of passages like 1 Chronicles 23.31 and Ezekiel 45.17, using the same three words to summarize all of Israel's special days of worship. Just as in Colossians, Sabbath is in the plural, but it clearly refers to the weekly Sabbath. The annual Sabbaths are described using a different word, he or te, translated Holy Day, just as elsewhere in the New Testament. Mr. Batchelor would have us believe that even though Paul is using another term for annual Sabbath, the word Sabbaton also means annual Sabbath, even though it's never used that way in the New Testament. He can't admit that Paul really means the annual, monthly, and weekly Holy Days for the Jews. Mr. Batchelor also says there will be Sabbaths in the new heavens and new earth, He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 66, but that passage includes the new moons that he admits Paul is rejecting. The passage simply can't mean what Mr. Batchelor says. 
but it does raise the question of how there can be new moons and Sabbaths when Paul says they've ended. It's resolved when you recognize that Isaiah often uses imagery of the Old Covenant to describe the spiritual realities of the new. In Isaiah chapter 56, God promises eunuchs a place in his house. Yet eunuchs were explicitly forbidden to enter the Jerusalem temple. None was ever given a place there. But Isaiah isn't portraying the temple made with hands, but its spiritual successor. The Apostle Paul is saying that just as the church still has a temple and high priest and sacrifices, it also has circumcision, new moons, and Sabbaths, but not in the way Israel observed them. The everlasting covenant of circumcision is no longer through the cutting of the flesh, but through baptism into Jesus. The Passover that was to be observed forever became the Lord's Supper. No more lambs were killed, because the true lamb had already died. The Lord's Supper not only reminds us of the old Passover, but also of the cross, and it looks forward to the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. Finally, the eternal covenant of the Sabbath became the Lord's Day. Instead of looking back to God's original creation with Adam, it looks to Jesus' resurrection and God's recreation of all things in the second Adam. Ordinances given at Sinai, such as a prohibition of fires on the Sabbath, passed away with the Old Covenant, but the spiritual substance remained. We realize that you've been told that Sunday worship is a sign of apostasy and that it will be the mark of the beast. But please hear us out. Though the apostles went into the synagogues on the Sabbath to preach, at no time in the New Testament do we ever see the church gathered for worship on Saturday after Jesus' resurrection. Adventists will often counter with Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, to insist on a continuing seventh-day Sabbath. But the context is Jesus telling his disciples to flee Jerusalem when they see the signs of its destruction. Not only would winter be a hindrance to their flight, but since the days of Nehemiah, Jerusalem's gates were shut on Saturday. Adventists will also argue that Hebrews 4.9 says that there remains a seventh-day Sabbath for the people of God. But that's not what it says. Not only is it not the same word used for Sabbath everywhere else in the New Testament, but the context is in looking for another day where we find our rest in Jesus. There does remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God, but as the Apostle Paul said, it is one of which the old Sabbaths were but a shadow. Jesus is the substance. He not only rose on the first day of the week, but was worshipped, preached to his disciples, and broke bread with them. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus' next appearance was eight days later when Thomas was present. Like the three days Jesus was in the tomb, Jews reckon any part of a day as a whole day, so it would have been the next Sunday. It was on yet another Sunday that the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, the eighth day after seven sets of sevens, an annual reminder of the year of Jubilee, when debts were canceled and slaves were set free. In addition to all this, Sunday is the only day singled out in the New Testament for the corporate worship of the church after Jesus' resurrection. In Acts 20, we're told that Paul was hurrying to Jerusalem, but he waited several days in Troas until Sunday so he could meet with the disciples break bread with them, and preach to them. It was also on the first day of the week that Paul instructed a collection to be taken up for the suffering saints in Jerusalem. Doug Batchelor counters this by saying, The first of the week, or at the beginning of the week, let every one of you lay by him, by him means at your home, in store. You don't store your stuff at church. There's nothing in the text about laying up the collection at home. The word translated store is the Greek word thesaurizo, the word from which we get the English word thesaurus. It's the same root as used in the Septuagint's translation of Malachi 3.10 for bringing the tithes into the house of the Lord. Since the church is the Lord's house, it makes perfect sense. But Jesus' resurrection on Sunday, his pattern of appearances on Sunday, the Spirit poured out on Pentecost Sunday, And the continuing example of the church worshiping on Sunday cannot convince Mr. Batchelor 
he imagines a very different origin. So if Sunday keeping isn't in the Bible, and I think I tried to establish that, where did it come from? Well, it comes from, just as the name implies, sun worship. Pretty soon there are a lot more Gentiles in the church than Jews, and the Gentiles, wanting to reach their pagan friends, they said, let's make as many accommodations as we can to try to reach them. And so for a while, in Rome, they actually, they worshiped the day of the sun on the first day of the week, and um, many Christians, they worshiped on the Sabbath. They said, you know, we'll get a lot more of them to join our church if we will also recognize Sunday. They thought they were being evangelistic. The Church of the Martyrs wasn't more concerned with popularity than faithfulness. Of course, Ellen White said it wasn't that church, but the church hundreds of years later that apostatized, during the days of Constantine. In the first centuries, the true Sabbath had been kept by all Christians. They were jealous for the honor of God, and, believing that His law is immutable, they zealously guarded the sacredness of its precepts. But with great subtlety, Satan worked through his agents to bring about his object. Mrs. White's claims are refuted by the testimonies of the earliest Christians. Ignatius was a pastor in Antioch. He was arrested and sentenced to be eaten by lions in the year 108. He had been directly taught by the Apostle John. Just before his death, he wrote, Those then who lived by ancient practices arrived at a new hope. They ceased to keep the Sabbath and lived by the Lord's day, on which our life, as well as theirs, shone forth, thanks to him and his death. Some Adventist scholars dispute the interpretation of Lord's Day, but no matter how they try to spin the text, Ignatius is clear that the seventh-day Sabbath had been abandoned, just as Paul had told the Colossians. This was repeated by many others. About the same time, a Christian named Barnabas wrote, Finally, he says to them, Your new moons and your Sabbaths I cannot stand. You see what is his meaning. It is not your present Sabbaths that are acceptable unto me, but the Sabbath which I have made, in the which when I have set all things at rest, I will make the beginning of the eighth day which is the beginning of another world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing, in the which also Jesus rose from the dead, and having been manifested, ascended into the heavens. J. N. Andrews recognized both these quotes in his History of the Sabbath, but he took quotes from church historians out of context to try to disprove them. If Johann Mosheim doubted that this particular Barnabas was the same as the companion of the Apostle Paul, Andrews announced it a forgery, even though Mosheim believed it to be written by a Christian of the second century. He also took Augustus Neander out of context to try to make Sunday worship a matter of human invention. Andrews ignored everything that didn't fit the narrative he was trying to construct. Despite all the claims of the Adventist, no one in the early church referred to the Lord's Day as anything but Sunday. But Doug Batchelor makes an interesting observation. First time also you're going to find the word seven mentioned three times. It says seven, seven, seven. It's a number associated with God. The seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Very specific. You get to the last book of the Bible. It's got another number associated with man who was made on the sixth day, and it's 666. So you got this contest between the worship of God and the worship of man that goes on through the Bible. What he ignores is that it was well known among the early Christians that Jesus' name has a numerical value in Greek of 888 and was understood as representing a new creation. The early church saw the Lord's Day not only in the teachings of the apostles, but as Barnabas described it, an eighth day, foreshadowed in the Old Testament by things such as circumcision on the eighth day and the eighth day of Pentecost. About the year 155, a Christian named Justin wrote the following. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the one presiding verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. 
Then we all rise together and pray, and, as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought. And the one presiding, in like manner, offers prayers and thanksgivings, according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. About ten years later, Justin was martyred for his faith. All of these quotes were from people born in the first century. These men were either taught by the apostles or by people taught by the apostles. We could offer many more examples that Sunday was the Lord's Day for the church long before Constantine was ever born. What we hope is clear is that the early church no more worshipped the sun by worshipping on Sunday than you worship Saturn by worshipping on Saturday. One of our pleas to you is to carefully examine what everyone is saying, because much of what your teachers tell you is simply wrong. The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday, it's a constitution of Constantine in 321 AD, enacting that all the courts of justice and inhabitants and towns and the workshops were to rest on Sunday. This makes it sound as if Constantine moved the church's worship to Sunday. If the quote were accurate, it would be impressive, but it's not. Here's the actual page from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mr. Batchelor left out, as a legal duty. Constantine didn't start the observance of Sunday. He simply created the first law to allow people to rest on that day. Mr. Batchelor also said this, is there any command, Episcopal writes, is there any command in the New Testament to change the day of the week of rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. That's their manual of Christian doctrine. Here's what Pastor Banks actually said. There is, indeed, no formal notice of the change of day, but there are plain indications of the change in practice. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. The simple fact of the absence of any definite beginning of the new practice proves that it goes back to the earliest days of the church. If the change had been made afterwards, either by authority or general agreement, we should find some mention of it. But there is none. Besides misquotation, much of what Adventism offers is innuendo and conspiracy theory. If any Christians fasted on Saturday, this is supposed to invalidate all the things they said about Sunday being the Lord's Day. If Roman Catholics claim the Pope established Sunday worship by his own authority, Adventists believe them, even though they know Rome has lied countless times over innumerable things, and can't point to such a declaration in the historic record. Spinning all of history into a war against the Fourth Commandment has allowed Adventists to not only divorce the early church and its martyrs from what they actually believed, but the early Protestants and their martyrs as well. Your church calls itself the heirs of these martyrs and reformers, yet it denounces their churches as Babylon. It keeps promising you that you'll be persecuted by a national Sunday law that never seems to materialize, while these men and women suffered actual persecution. Do you believe they stood bravely against the idolatry, indulgences, and all the corruptions of Rome, but feared to take a stand for the fourth commandment? Do you really believe they were so ignorant of the Bible and clinging to the mark of papal authority, even as Rome was killing them? The reality is that the Sabbath was never the real reason for the Adventist break with Protestantism. It only became an issue years later, and it has served as a convenient distraction from having to defend end-time speculations from the 19th century. William Miller was living in the early days of the American Republic. His father had thrown off the rule of the British king in the American Revolution, and he himself had fought to maintain that freedom in the War of 1812. In 1815, an army of American farmers had humiliated the greatest empire on earth at the Battle of New Orleans. The idea seemed completely reasonable, that an American freed from the traditions of men should be able to find biblical secrets undiscovered for thousands of years. Armed with nothing but a King James Bible and a Cruden's Concordance, Miller set out to make sense of what he believed to be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy all around him. He had grown up with stories of how less than two years before he was born, the day of May 19th had started bright and clear in New England. 
but by noon there was a great darkness in the land. In his youth, revolutionary France had made the atheistic cult of reason its state religion and worshipped a harlot as its goddess. Then, in 1816, he experienced what was known as the year without a summer. Volcanic ash dimmed the sun and made the moon appear red as blood at night. There was frost in summer, crops failed, and there was hunger throughout the world. He soon concluded that the Bible proved the imminent return of Jesus. He believed this was confirmed in 1833 when a Leonid meteor shower lit up the night sky as bright as day, making it appear as if the stars were now falling from the heavens. Miller based his expected date of 1843 on the time of the end in Daniel chapter 8. He believed the 2300 days must symbolize years as in Numbers 14 and Ezekiel 4, and he assumed the cleansing of the sanctuary must be the return of Jesus to cleanse the earth and the church. The problem is that the same language of the end is used elsewhere in the Old Testament for judgments other than the final one, and there's nothing in the context of Daniel 8 to point to events thousands of years in the future. It specifically concerns the ancient kingdom of the Medes and Persians, represented by a ram, and the ancient kingdom of the Greeks, represented by a goat with a single notable horn. We're told that horn symbolized the empire's first king. We know him to be Alexander the Great, and as prophesied, he led Greece to conquer the Medes and Persians. Verse 8 tells us that when the goat was strong, the horn was broken. Alexander died at the age of 32, having conquered from Macedonia to India. And as Daniel saw four horns spring up in the place of the first, his empire was divided among his four generals. Then we're told, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. This is the immediate context of the 2300 days. The problem is that even if Miller calculated his 2300 years from Alexander's birth, they would stretch far beyond what he saw as the signs of the times. He discovered a way around the problem. In Daniel 9.24, he learned that the word translated determine can also be translated as divide. So he cut off the 490 years in Daniel 9 from the 2300 in Daniel 8. By figuring they ended with the death of Christ, this allowed him to start the 2300 years before the birth of Alexander and conclude with the year 1843. When it was pointed out that there was no year zero, the date became 1844. As neatly as it now seemed to add up, he had to start his timeline before there was a Greek empire and run it to over 1900 years after it ended. Miller recognized that the empires of Babylon, the Medo-Persians, Greece, and Rome were the four parts of the image in Daniel 2. He recognized them as the four distinct beasts in Daniel 7. But he had to blend the Greek and Roman empires together in Daniel 8 to make the 2300 years fit. It simply doesn't work. The first horn was a Greek king. The next four horns were also Greek kings. And Daniel 8.23 specifically says the little horn was another king. But Miller claimed instead that it was the Roman Empire. The Greek Empire never included Rome, so it's difficult to argue that it arose from one of the four horns. And though Miller tried to dismiss him, there was a Greek king who did fulfill the prophecies of Daniel 8. Antiochus IV was the king of the Seleucid Empire with his capital in Antioch. He had stolen the throne from his brother and given himself the name Epiphanes, meaning God manifest. Alexander the Great had accepted worship as the son of Zeus, but Antiochus was now demanding to be worshipped as Zeus. Israel was an unwilling part of his empire. In the year 168 BC, word reached Jerusalem that he had been killed in Egypt, and the Jews revolted against the high priest he had installed. 
but Antiochus wasn't dead. He soon came back from Egypt with his army and looted Jerusalem, slaughtering 40,000 of the Jews and selling another 40,000 into slavery. He tortured and killed those who refused to eat pork. Mothers who had their sons circumcised were crucified with their strangled babies hung around their necks. He also rededicated the Jerusalem temple to Zeus and sacrificed a pig on its altar. He set up an idol in the temple, bearing his own likeness. Though it's not to be confused with the word of God, in 1 Maccabees, the Jews identified this as Daniel's abomination of desolation. For three years, Israel's daily sacrifice couldn't be observed because God's temple was used for the worship of Zeus through the offering of pig's blood. The question of Daniel 8.14 is how long this will all continue. Miller ignored the clear context because he was convinced that Antiochus' kingdom wasn't grand enough to fulfill the prophecy. The King James translation says the goat waxed very great under the first horn, but the little horn waxed exceeding great. Not knowing Hebrew, Miller thought the little horn's empire must be bigger and more powerful than Alexander's. But as seen in more modern translations, the text simply doesn't support that implication. In spite of all his arrogance and persecution of God's people, Antiochus was still only a little horn. Though years and days are made to symbolize one another in Numbers 14 and Ezekiel 4, that symbolism is explicit and limited to the immediate context. There's no evidence that this was ever intended to be a rule of interpretation for the rest of Scripture. Daniel 8 doesn't even use the same word for day as Numbers and Ezekiel. They use the Hebrew word yom, but Daniel uses the words erev and boker. Literally, evenings and mornings. Genesis chapter 1 describes the first six days of creation by the formula that there was evening and morning. But nowhere does the Bible use these terms as simply a synonym for yom. Instead, they're generally in the context of evening and morning sacrifices. The 2300 evenings and mornings approximate the sacrifices that couldn't be offered during the three years of the temple's defilement under Antiochus. Though the days were cut short, nothing in the text lends itself to making it about the second coming over 1,900 years after the collapse of the Greek Empire. If it's argued that the language of exaltation is too much for Antiochus, it needs to be remembered that he set up an idol of himself in the temple of God. There are other issues with Miller's timeline. The 70 weeks of Daniel 9 aren't weeks of days in Hebrew but literally 77s. They can be used for weeks of days, but they are in the context of the land enjoying its annual Sabbaths during Israel's 70 years of exile. They provide no support to Miller's year-day theory. Though many pointed out Miller's errors, Adventists assumed their critics were simply hostile to the Second Coming. They held that the Bible was clear that it was 2,300 years and Jesus would return no later than March 21, 1844. When that date came and went, some Adventists embraced the Seventh Month Movement, claiming the Karaite calendar indicated October 22, 1844. But that date came and went as well. Finally, William Miller admitted his error. We expected the personal coming of Christ at that time, and now to contend that we were not mistaken, is dishonest. We should never be ashamed to frankly confess all our errors. I have no confidence in any of the new theories that have grown out of that movement, that is, that Christ then came as the bridegroom, that the door of mercy was closed, that there is no salvation for sinners, that the seventh trumpet then sounded, or that it was a fulfillment of prophecy in any sense. The door of mercy being closed and salvation no longer being possible for sinners was referring to the teachings of the founders of your church. James White wrote, The doctrine of the Second Advent of Christ called out a devoted people who took their Bibles for their light and who confidently expected to meet Christ the Bridegroom in 1843. We were disappointed, but soon we saw that the 2300 days extended to 1844 when we came up to that point of time, 
all our sympathy, burden, and prayers for sinners ceased, and the unanimous feeling and testimony was that our work for the world was finished forever. The sinner, to whom Jesus had stretched out his arms all the day long, and who had rejected the offers of salvation, was left without an advocate when Jesus passed from the holy place and shut that door in 1844. The professed church, who rejected the truth, was also rejected and smitten with blindness. Doug Batchelor comments. Last one, shut door. How many of you have heard shut door? Let me see your hands. Just a handful of you. Maybe I ought to not even mention this, but I think I ought to. You're going to run into it. In Walter Martin's book, he makes a point of this, and a few other people. Back in 1844, when they thought Jesus was going to come, there was no such thing as a Seventh-day Adventist church back then. You all aware of that? Ellen White had her first vision then, when she was 17. She was one of the Advent believers. They were Sunday keepers back then. They were largely Baptists and Methodists and all different churches. They believed that the Protestants who had not accepted the message that the bridegroom was coming and the wedding was opened and, and you need to enter in and the door is shut, they could not be converted. Those who had heard the message of the soon coming of Jesus that did not accept it, probation had closed for them, the door had shut. They believed that back then. She admits that she believed it. And it was a few years after her first vision, she still did not believe any differently. Her visions never had anything to do with the shut door. He's quoting from a letter Mrs. White wrote in 1874, long after the shut door doctrine had been rejected. It doesn't fit with what she was actually saying in the 1840s. In the day star of January 24, 1847, she described a vision. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm, and from his arm came a glorious light which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Hallelujah! Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, which left their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and got their eyes off the mark and lost sight of Jesus and fell off the path down in the dark and wicked world below. It was just as impossible for them to get on the path again and go to the city as all the wicked world which God had rejected. In a letter to Joseph Bates, Mrs. White described another vision. While in Exeter, Maine, in meeting with Israel Damon, James, and many others, many of them did not believe in a shut door. I suffered much at the commencement of the meeting. Unbelief seemed to be on every hand. When I came out of vision, my ears were saluted with Sister Durbin singing and shouting with a loud voice. Most of them received the vision and were settled upon the shut door. Though the Adventist Church today tries to deny it, Ellen White's visions confirmed her in the idea that the door of mercy had been shut to the whole world, except for the faithful Adventist. She called Daniel 8.14 the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith. It couldn't be admitted that the 2300 evenings and mornings weren't years, because there was much more at stake than the timing of Jesus' return. Long before becoming Adventist, James White, Joseph Bates, and others had rejected the Trinity and an eternal hell as inventions of the Pope. They called themselves the true remnant church and continued to do so as Adventists. They declared the Protestant churches to be part of Babylon. William Miller was appalled. In the fall of 43, some of my brethren began to call the churches Babylon and to urge that it was the duty of Adventists to come out of them. With this I was much grieved, as not only the effect was very bad, but I regarded it as a perversion of the Word of God, a resting of Scripture. Miller also couldn't join them in their anti-Trinitarianism annihilationism, or in their attempts to explain away the great disappointment. Men have crept in unawares, who have given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, teaching lies and hypocrisy, denying any personal existence of Christ, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from certain kinds of food, denying the right to pray for sinners, 
and commanding to violate our social duties, etc. With such things, I have no sympathy. The doctrine of the Advent was the faith of the primitive church, while the doctrine of annihilation was no part of their faith. It evidently arises from a mistaken use of Bible terms and a stress on words not warranted by parallel scriptures. Adventism has to defend William Miller in order to maintain its claims to 1844. But he rejected many of the positions that define your church as the doctrines of devils. He insisted the sanctuary in Daniel 8 was not in heaven, but on earth. He rejected the seventh-day Sabbath, annihilationism, and your prohibitions on foods. He did all this on the basis of the Bible. Where you differ is where your church appeals to visions to justify its claims. And yet those visions have proven untrustworthy. As more and more children were born to whom the door of mercy was supposedly shut, the doctrine was eventually revised. Mrs. White no longer said the door was shut to the whole world, but only to those who clearly saw the Advent light and rejected it. Rather than Jesus having shut the door to repentance, it was eventually said he had begun investigative judgment by entering the Holy of Holies for the first time in 1844. This may seem more hopeful than the shut door, but it's just as contradictory to the Word of God. In Hebrews 6, Jesus is described as having already entered the veil. But Adventists contend this only refers to the outer court of the temple, the holy place, but not the holiest of all. Their problem is that the exact same expression is used in the Septuagint's version of Leviticus 16.2. There it describes Aaron, the high priest, entering the veil into the Holy of Holies, where God would appear to him on the mercy seat of the ark. In Hebrews 9, we're reminded of the high priest who entered into the holiest place once a year on the Day of Atonement with the blood of bulls and goats. That's contrasted with Jesus, who had already entered once for all with his own blood. Though some Adventists try to avoid the fact that the mercy seat was in the Holy of Holies, Jesus is repeatedly shown as seated at God's right hand and seated on God's throne. As if all this wasn't clear enough, How does the passage we saw earlier make any sense if Jesus had not already entered into the holiest himself? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Mrs. White had a vision. The investigative judgment was supposed to last no longer than the lifetimes of those at an 1856 conference. She said some would be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. Of course, that has since been relegated to the dustbin of history, along with the shut door. Eventually, the anti-Trinitarianism was jettisoned as well, because by 1847, Adventists had discovered a new basis on which to denounce the Protestant churches, the Seventh-day Sabbath. Pork was eventually added as another test of true faithfulness, despite the fact that there was no prohibition on eating unclean animals before the ceremonial law was given. Noah was told what animals were clean and unclean in Genesis 7. But in Genesis 9, he was told he could eat anything that moved, only not with its blood. The Jerusalem Council repeated the same prohibition, but said nothing of the kosher diet of Leviticus. We won't go through the numerous evidences from Scripture and the writings of the early church. We won't engage whether it's wise to eat anything that moves, but we'll simply point out that as late as 1850, James White publicly agreed that there was no biblical prohibition on eating unclean animals. But like Sunday worship, pork was eventually denounced. Your church teaches that at his second coming, the Lord will destroy those who know what his word requires, yet eat swine's flesh and other unclean foods. It's worth noting that Mrs. White continued to enjoy oysters long after denouncing pork. This is in spite of the fact that they are called an abomination in the very same chapter of Leviticus. Leviticus.
The simple reality is that the entire Adventist movement was based on people convincing themselves that the Protestant churches were spiritualizing away the clear meaning of the Bible and failing to recognize the signs of Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation that they believed were being fulfilled all around them. They were certain these indicated Jesus' imminent return and proved the apostasy of the Protestants. They were wrong. Their attempt to read those events into the Bible was only possible through an ignorance of the original languages and an ignorance of the overall context of Scripture. They extend the Roman Empire through millennia because they refuse to recognize the present reality of Christ's kingdom. When Jesus promised that the kingdom was at hand, he didn't mean two millennia in the future. The stone cut without hands in Daniel 2 struck the image in the days of ancient Rome and has been growing and filling the earth ever since. The kingdom didn't come with the observation Adventists expected. It started small, like leaven in a lump of dough, or as the mustard seed. But it has come, and it has grown. It will come in its fullness at Jesus' second coming. But the gospel has already gone out to the nations, and nearly one-third of the world gives at least lip service to the lordship of Christ. There are many who clearly define their faith contrary to the Bible, but there are many others who faithfully follow God's word. In spite of all the counterfeits, we've come a long way from an upper room. The Protestant churches of the 19th century weren't hostile to the second coming, but to William Miller's errors and to the heresies promoted by other Adventists. In contrast with Miller, the Protestant reformers and their successors were men of great learning. They could read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. They let Scripture interpret Scripture, rather than imposing meanings on it. In contrast with James White, Joseph Bates, and Uriah Smith, they also knew their church history. Their rejection of Rome wasn't based on a new and novel reading of the Scriptures. The printing presses that had made the Bible available were also making available the writings of the early church. The Reformers found that the Christians of the first centuries read the Bible in much the same way they did, and were just as hostile to Rome's idolatry and works righteousness. In his final edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin not only expounded the Scriptures, but quoted from the early church over 800 times to demonstrate that Rome had abandoned the historic Christian faith. The great irony is that in seeking to denounce everyone else as holding to popish traditions, Adventism has ended up with a faith that greatly resembles Rome in terms of Scripture and the Gospel. The Reformers insisted that the Bible alone is infallible, and that what was unclear in one part could be understood by what was clear in other parts. Rome admits the Scriptures are the Word of God, and infallible, but then claims only the Pope can authoritatively interpret them. Your church claims the same for Mrs. White. Rome adds other things to those scriptures that it says came from God. Your church does the same thing with Mrs. White's visions. In the same way that the Protestant Reformation was never about the authority of scripture but its sufficiency, it was never about the necessity of grace but about its sufficiency. Rome agrees that we are justified by grace, but not by grace alone. The Council of Trent asserted that though the fall of Adam injured us, by grace, we can still keep God's law. They anathematized anyone who would disagree. They claimed that justification was only complete when we are fully sanctified. They said it was by an infused righteousness that allows us to cooperate in sanctifying ourselves and keeping ourselves in the faith. They failed to see that God describes us as needing far more than an infusion of grace. We are by nature slaves to our sins and spiritually dead. We may freely choose, but our wills are in bondage to hearts that God describes as deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Ezekiel describes us as needing our stony hearts taken out and replaced with new ones. Trin also failed to see what Jesus revealed as the true nature of God's law. It's not just killing with our hands, but unjust anger in our hearts that constitutes murder. Even looking on a woman with lust is adultery. God sees not only our actions, but our hearts, and He requires perfect obedience. 
When asked the greatest commandment, Jesus didn't name the Sabbath, but rather to love God with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our minds, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is why God describes even our righteousnesses as filthy rags. In Luke 18, Jesus contrasted one who thought he could keep the law with one who knew he never could. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Rome blends grace and works in much the same way that the Galatians did, who taught that Christians had to keep the ceremonial law and be circumcised in order to be saved. The Apostle Paul told them, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Paul is saying that justification is either all of grace or all of law. In trying to prove their worthiness, the Galatians were denying Christ's worthiness. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. The Protestant Reformation wasn't about God helping good people save themselves. It was about the justification of unworthy sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. The biblical gospel isn't about God infusing righteousness so that we can prove our worthiness, but about being raised from spiritual death and having the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to us in the great exchange. Jesus took our rebellious hearts and nailed them to the cross. He gives us a new heart that loves him. He took our sins upon himself and paid their penalty so that we could have his perfect righteousness counted to us. Finally, he crucified our poisonous life and put his Holy Spirit within us. All of this is presented as a free gift. Your church will often caricature this as praying a prayer and living like a pagan. There are people who promote such a false gospel, but to confuse that with what the early church and the reformers taught is like confusing what you teach with the second Adventist who became the Jehovah's Witnesses. Please hear us for what we are actually saying, rather than how others want to spin it. Justification isn't a slow process tied to our sanctification. It is a judicial declaration that Christ has fulfilled the whole law for us. Hebrews 10.14 tells us that even though sanctification is an ongoing work of God's Spirit in the believer, we are counted perfect when we are united with Jesus. His perfect righteousness is counted to us as our sins were counted to Him. The new birth doesn't come from our works, but it does produce good works. These works don't make us worthy, but are the fruit of Christ's Spirit in us and help to give us assurance. John Calvin said, Our assurance, our glory, and the sole anchor of our salvation are that Christ the Son of God is ours and we in turn are in him sons of God, 
and heirs of the kingdom of heaven, called to the hope of eternal blessedness by God's grace, not by our worth. Compare that with what Mrs. White taught. Improve the short probationary time given you by working with your might to redeem the failures of your past life. God has placed you in a world of suffering to prove you, to see if you will be found worthy of the gift of eternal life. The Apostle Paul described the Jews of his time as having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They carefully observed the seventh-day Sabbath and kosher diet. They drew near to God with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. Rome also has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. It confesses Jesus as Savior, but He is pushed to the background of their faith. Their real focus is Mary, their confessions, their penances, and their righteousness. What is the real focus of your faith? Like Rome, Adventism claims to be the one true church, in spite of the fact that it's had to back up from gross errors, such as the shut door and the denial of the Trinity. There are a host of other issues as well. Ellen White said the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 was a fulfillment of Revelation 6.12. Despite her claims, there were greater earthquakes before, and there have been greater ones since. The 2004 earthquake in the Indian Ocean was not only bigger, but it killed ten times as many people. Yet Lisbon is supposed to be the sign of the end, 265 years ago. The same Jesus who created all things from nothing in the space of six days has supposedly spent the last 176 years in investigative judgment. Please be clear. We're not saying Jesus isn't coming back. We're saying that 1844 was wrong. We're saying that in spite of all its claims, your church is not the true remnant. Christ's church has always battled heretics, nominalism, and a host of other errors but the gates of hell have never prevailed against it. There was no great apostasy from which Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, or Ellen White needed to rescue it. The Pope of Rome is an antichrist, but the answer isn't to create another pope. It's to listen to how faithful generations have dealt with the scriptures and to test what everyone says by God's inerrant word is to recognize that the Trinity and Sunday worship aren't traditions of men, but part of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. A faith focused not on a seventh-day Sabbath or your worthiness, but rather a faith focused on Jesus Christ. Your teachers try to confuse you with talk of tens of thousands of denominations. They don't tell you where they got their numbers or how they're calculated. They won't tell you that Adventism is counted 256 times on that list. There are differences in understanding the Bible, but most of the divisions are from churches like yours who add new revelations to it. Adventism claims to vindicate the character of God by denying eternal punishment and promoting the doctrine of soul sleep. Your teachers make statements like this. Now, some translations like the King James say, Verily I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That obviously is punctuation wrongly placed. You realize there's no punctuation in the Greek. The translators had to figure, where do we want to put that comma? And they put the comma in the wrong place. So it sounds like Jesus went to paradise that day with a thief. But you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, Mary's clinging to Jesus' ankles. He says, do not cling to me because I've not yet ascended to my Father. So how could the thief be with Jesus in paradise if Jesus hadn't gone yet? Jesus had not ascended in the resurrection body he told Mary not to touch. But the Apostle Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Revelation 6 describes the souls of the dead being with the Father and crying for his judgment before their physical resurrection. In spite of this, Mr. Batchelor insists that Jesus could not have been absent from his body that day. He also misrepresents the Greek. It's true that the ancient manuscripts didn't have punctuation. In fact, they didn't even have spacing between words. But the translators aren't left to guess at meanings 
Unlike English, Greek uses different constructions of words to indicate usage. Greek grammar is not a guessing game, and it makes clear that Jesus said the thief would be with him that very day in paradise. Our plea to you is to test everything by the Word of God. Search the Scriptures and flee to the Jesus you find there. He is the one who offers real rest for your souls. In 1845, William Miller pleaded with the Adventists not to be led astray by those preaching annihilationism, prohibitions on meats, and other things he called doctrines of devils. We'll leave you with his words. Go to Christ, I beseech you. Lay hold on the promise of God. Trust in his grace, and he will cleanse you by his blood. 